Hello and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Andy West and in this episode, we're going to consoleize an original Game Boy. That means we'll be transforming it from a handheld system into a TV-connected console more like the NES. We'll take the video signal that normally goes to the built-in LCD screen and convert it to VGA and HDMI. And we'll also hook up a controller port so we can use a wired NES controller. Now I'm certainly not the first person to come up with this idea, and in fact if you visit the community at element14.com, you can find the Gamebox DMG Consoleizer, which is a great project, and you should definitely check it out. But unlike that project, which uses an FPGA, we'll be using the inexpensive yet powerful Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. Well, I don't know about you, but I really want to play some Game Boy games on the big screen. So, let's get started. I've picked up some broken game consoles and accessories that we're going to use in our build. First, we've got the Game Boy itself. In addition to some battery corrosion, which I've already cleaned up, you can see that the top of the screen is damaged. And that's fine, because we won't be needing the screen for this project. Then we've got the shell from a non-functioning Nintendo Entertainment System. It's so yellow that it's actually brown. We'll use this as the enclosure for our console. Finally, we've got an NES controller, which I've chosen because it has the same button layout as the Game Boy. I mentioned earlier that we're going to use the Raspberry Pi Pico. Actually, we're going to use two. One for the video conversion, and the other to handle controller input. Generating a VGA signal takes most of the GPIO pins of a single Pico, and adding an extra one isn't a big deal because they're small and they consume very little power. You can buy pre-built VGA boards for the Pico, but the ones I found cost multiple times what the Pico costs. So we're going to do it the fun way and build our own VGA hardware using some resistors. To start with, I like to use breakaway pin headers. These ones have 40 pins, so if we cut them in half with some flush cutters, we'll have exactly the right amount for each side. I find it easiest to solder these in an old, worn-out breadboard that I'm not using for anything else. Flux will make the job easier. I use a flux pen, but there's various different kinds of flux you can use based on your own preference. We tack down opposite corners with solder first to hold the board in place, and then we just carefully solder down the line. If you accidentally bridge two pins, you can separate them with your iron like so. And when we're done, we should have nice, shiny, uniform joints like this. Before we continue with the hardware, let's take a look at programming the Pico. I'm mainly a Windows user, but installing the C++ toolchain for Windows can be a bit of a chore. So I'm going to recommend getting yourself a Raspberry Pi 4. If you start with a clean OS install, then setting it up for Pico development is actually pretty simple. After you install Raspberry Pi OS, but before you do anything else, open the terminal and do an update and an upgrade to make sure you have the latest versions of all the software. Then, over on the documentation page for the SDK setup, there's a link to a setup script you can run. So from the command line, we're going to get the script, then we want to make it executable, and finally run it. You'll have to wait about 25 minutes, but it automatically does all the steps that you'd have to do manually in Windows. When it's finished, reboot the machine and go to the Pico slash Pico Playground folder. Run CMake and then Make, which builds the example programs in that location. Again, you'll have to wait a while for it to complete. In the scan video slash sprite demo folder is the UF2 file we're going to install on the Pico for our VGA test. Click on the file and press Ctrl C to copy the file. Then, hold down the white button while plugging the Pico into the Pi 4 via USB. When you release the button, a folder will appear where you can copy the UF2 file with Ctrl V. That will trigger the program of the Pico and the folder will close on its own. And that's it! The Pico's programmed. Okay, getting back to the hardware, I've got two breadboards side by side because we're going to need space on one side to add our DAC, which is made of resistors. I've already started adding some, and you can see how they're straddling the power and ground rails there. Here's the graphic showing the resistor values and how they're grouped into red, green, blue, and sync signals. You might find that you don't have all the exact right values. For example, I don't have any 8K resistors, but that's okay. We can simply take a 7.5 kilo ohm resistor and a 470 ohm resistor and twist them together. And if we measure them with the multimeter, we get very close to the 8 kilo ohms that we need. Here's the VGA connector I went with. It opens up to reveal a breakout board, which is great for prototyping. I've screwed in several jumper wires so we can plug this directly into the breadboard as well. Here's all the resistors added, along with some jumper wires to combine the outputs for each color component. I've tried to make things easier by matching the color of the wires to the signals. 
We've already programmed the Pico, so all that's left is to plug in the power and VGA. Let's see if we get anything. <laughs> it works! It's time to open up the Game Boy. The front and back halves are connected with a cable, so carefully unplug it. We only care about the back, so put the front half aside. I've already been in here trying to clean up the battery corrosion, and you can see just how bad it was. I actually had to fully desolder and reconnect the cartridge port. After removing a few more screws, we can take out the main board entirely. This connector, where we remove the flat cable, is where the video and controller signals are. We want to remove this so we can solder some ribbon cables to the pins. First, we want to apply flux liberally to the pins. Then we melt a bunch of fresh solder onto them and suck up as much of it as we can with some solder wick. We're going to apply some low temperature solder called chip quick. I have a loose piece of it here that I'll just put in place. This stuff melts super fast at normal soldering temperatures and it stays molten for a long time. We just melt that across all the pins and you want to lift with minimal force so we don't damage the board. After we've cleaned everything up and retuned the pads with regular solder, this is the result. Nice and shiny, just like new. Here's a close up look. I've numbered and color coded the pads in this graphic so we can easily see which ones are video related. V-Sync pulses once per frame, H-Sync is once per line, clock is per pixel, and data 0 and data 1 are the actual pixel color data. Two bits means four possible colors, as expected on the original Game Boy. I used the graphic as a reference when soldering on this ribbon cable, which has jumper cables on the other end. And as you can probably guess, this will be used for more breadboard prototyping. Like other Raspberry Pi boards, the Pico does not have 5 volt tolerant inputs, so we're using an 8-bit level shifter. Just remember to tie any unused inputs to ground. Sometimes I forget to do that, and it causes weird problems with the signals. That covers most of what we need for the video hardware-wise. Now let's jump into some code. We're overclocking this Pico to 300 MHz because video can be rather processor intense. It's worth noting that you can only set this value in multiples of 50 MHz. We've got two loops doing the interesting work, one on each core. Core 0 gets video data from the Game Boy and writes it to a frame buffer. The different section of code in the loop correspond to different parts of the LCD signal. We wait for VSync to go high to start a frame, then for each line we wait for HSync to go high, and this innermost loop is where we read pixel data in time of the clock. We've got exactly 20 no-ops, which produces a tiny delay, and that gives us the best timing for a correct signal. I came up with that specific number through trial and error. On Core 1 we draw the frame buffer. Now this function gets called for each scan line and takes a pointer to the scan line buffer. We build up a scan line with these tokens that start with composable along with pixels from the frame buffer. The tokens are used by the scan video library to create an image. Now here we're writing the same pixel value twice and that has the effect of scaling the image up two times horizontally to fill the screen. And over here we're indexing to the frame buffer with y times 0.6 and that stretches the final image vertically. Now I'm going to show you one thing in here even though we haven't built the hardware support for it yet and that's this array of colors defined in the beginning. These are actually color palettes and what we're going to do is wire up a GPIO pin to a button on the console that will let us change the color scheme on the fly and you can see I've already implemented the logic for this. We're just incrementing this color offset every time the button's pressed and when we get to the end we loop back around to the beginning. And you might have noticed that we incorporate this color offset into our scanline generating code and that's how the frame gets drawn with the palette we choose. I think it's time to test this with a game cartridge. Remember there's no controller or sound support yet, so we can't play a game, but we'll deal with that soon enough. Let's get the Pico programmed with this new code. Woohoo, we have video! And now we know that even with all the corrosion, the Game Boy does in fact work. That's great if all you want to do is stare at a bunch of title screens, but we want to be able to play these games, so let's set up our other Pico to handle NES controller input. On a separate breadboard I've added 8 yellow LEDs. We want to program these to light up when the buttons are pressed, and that'll prove that we've got our timings and everything correct. These are the pins in the connector of an NES gamepad. The signals are latch, clock, and data. When the console wants to read controller data it sets latch high briefly, and then pulses once for each button. For each one of these pulses, the data line will go low if the corresponding button is pressed. We're not plugging this into an NES, so the Raspberry Pi Pico will act as a console in this case. The code for this is simple. Here's the latch going high, here's the 8 pulses, and for each one we store the button state. And this loop sets the LEDs according to whether the buttons are pressed or not. 
Let's try it out. Yeah, that's working nicely. I can press a single button or multiple buttons and it still does the right thing. Now that we know how to fetch the state of our buttons, we need to transmit that state to the Game Boy, which handles input differently than the NES. And this is where things get kind of interesting. I found a Game Boy schematic that somebody made way back in 1997. In the corner of the drawing is the joypad section, and here we've got DA1 through DA4, and I'm pretty sure that stands for diode array because it also says DAN215. When you Google for DAN215 datasheets, you get silicon diode arrays. These let you select what group of buttons you want to read from. And depending on how you set pins P14 and P15, you can read either A, B, select and start, or the direction pads up, down, left, and right. And this allowed Nintendo to use six pins for input instead of eight. Just like I did for the video pins, I've color coded the input pins in this diagram. And once again, I've set it on a ribbon cable with some jumper wires. Now at this point, I decided to remove the corroded sheet of copper that was on there and the board looks so much better now. If you have any idea what purpose that serves, please let me know. Maybe it's some sort of RF shielding? The final code we'll use in our console is really similar to our LED test, but we'll use the other processor core to send input signals to the Game Boy. Now we've got three possibilities that make sense. The first is the D-pad selected. The second is the other group of buttons are selected, which are A, B, select, and start. And finally, nothing is selected. Now, at first I didn't think the third option was important because why would you ever read the buttons when no buttons are selected? But it turns out that the Super Game Boy games abuse the joypad registers. You never know what kind of strange quirks you might encounter on a project like this. Hello, I'm James from Workbench Wednesdays, a show about the stuff found on your electronics workbench. Look for new episodes on, well, Wednesdays. You can connect with me over on the Element 14 community. I look forward to seeing you. For now, it is time to get back to watching this week's project video. We only have a couple things left to do before we've got a fully functioning breadboard prototype. The first is adding an inexpensive off-the-shelf VGA to HDMI converter. Now this is totally optional, and if you're building your own console and you prefer to leave it as VGA, that's obviously that's up to you, but I prefer mine to have an HDMI output. Next, we wanna take the power, reset button, and power LED from our broken NES console and wire that up to the Game Boy internals. And here's where I made a mistake. If you look at this original board, you can see that the LED is connected to the reset button. I didn't want that, so I figured I'd cut a small notch in the board with some snips. These work great for cutting protoboard, but as soon as they touch that old PCB, it snapped right in half. So I made a new board, wired it up, and added a resistor for the LED. And yes, I did cut the new board with the same snips and it worked perfectly. All right, here it is. I've got the sound plugged into the HDMI converter, and I've got a little LCD monitor for testing. What do you think? Should we try it? Oh man, this looks so good. This is really fun, but I just feel like it's super fragile right now. Like if I bump it, some wire's gonna fall out and the whole thing's just gonna just crash. All right, let's do something about that. Okay, we're on the home stretch. I wanna get everything moved over to some permaproto boards, and then we'll 3D print some adapters to mount them in the NES shell with as little cutting as possible. I've cut up some disposable container lids to create templates, which are then used as a reference when designing the 3D prints. The lids are transparent, which makes it easy to mark where the screw hole should be. I design all my parts in Blender and then export to SDL files, which I'll make available for download on the community website. You may have to tweak them a little if you have different boards than I do, but it should give you a good starting point at least. I've cut a rectangular hole to accommodate a snap-in HDMI cable, and the VGA to HDMI converter conveniently fits securely between these posts without any fasteners or adhesives. You can see we're taking full advantage of the space inside the shell, and that's fine. The only concern is to make sure that we're not blocking airflow, and I don't think that's a problem here. If I was a little more clever about the layout, I could have mounted the Game Boy in the front so you could just insert cartridges through the slot, but I figured it'd be easier to just back up my games to a flash cart. I filled in the holes where the audio and video ports were previously with some epoxy, which can be sanded and painted for an attractive finish. And speaking of paint, I wanted to give the console a Game Boy themed appearance, so I picked up some spray paint at the local hardware store and matched the colors from memory, so they're not very accurate. Even so, I was able to achieve the effect I was going for. For the controller, we just print our design on label paper, cut it to shape, and spray it with a few coats of matte finish. 
I was surprised to find that Game Boy buttons actually fit perfectly in an NES controller. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison with the original handheld, and I'd call this a pretty successful adaptation. For the console logo, we print on the glossy backing of a label sheet. Then we use some packing tape to lift the toner off the backing, which basically gives you a sticker. Carefully place it on the cartridge door and spray the whole thing with satin finish to give it a more uniform look. And here it is. Of course, there are many different ways to play classic games these days, most of them involving emulation, but I like that this is using original hardware under the hood. I've loaded up with a few dozen color palettes, including the ones that came with the Super Game Boy, which was a peripheral made for the Super Nintendo in the mid-90s. It's fun trying to find palettes that go with a particular game, and uh, you can even emulate the colors of the original Game Boy screen if you want something a little more authentic. I hooked up the system in the living room and let my kids give it a try, and they each immediately found games that they liked. We even got the link cable working, and I played some head-to-head -head Dr. Mario against my wife. She played on the big screen while I used the regular Game Boy, and uh, that's my excuse for losing so badly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the reason. That's all we have for today. Have you ever tried to hack a retro video game or console? How did you accomplish it? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com presents, and we'll see you next time.